Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this new day, for this opportunity to meet together as we meet in Jesus' name. We are mindful of your faithfulness to us. And we want to be faithful in our communities. We want to be witnesses for you where we live. We just pray, Heavenly Father, that in this hour you will fill us with a love for those around us that you have for them. Uh, we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would give us an openness to your word and to your spirit leading us. And that we may meet with you in this hour. That you would meet with us. And that you would help us to hear your word and to become more like your son and to join in serving you in your mission in this world that you've made and which you love. You love the nations and the people of the world. We, we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would use us. Be with us this morning in our thinking, in our discussions. Pray for David and Maura as they lead us. Thank you for them and their service. We lift ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Maura, over to you. Just want to remind you again this morning of the resources which you can find on the portal and if you get a few minutes um, do come up, up here and just rummage through some of the stuff there's not a lot of stuff here but we're very aware that we don't have time to talk about everything um, and there are a set of um, Bible study materials which are really useful um, if you are doing Bible study with speakers of other languages you can adapt them and use them quite easily so do have a rummage through those um, just wanted to bring to your attention a set of books, these books. So we were talking about um, faith, God's faithfulness in our churches on Tuesday. And I'm aware that some of you use English language as a tool for outreach. And these books have been written for busy teachers or people that are, are, are working in other spheres of life. Come, come home in the evening want to get involved in teaching English, don't have a lot of time to prepare, and these materials were made for them. So basically, they have everything um, an English language teacher would need in terms of lesson plans and materials and cards and games, and they're all in the back there for you to use. So there are two, um, two of these that deal with topics. They're just English language topics. But um, there were a lot of requests made from people um, to jump from English language to sharing the scriptures. And so there were two books written with that in mind. And some of you may know Jane and Andy McNabb. Um, they were involved in writing these materials, which are stories, they're storytelling stories from Genesis right through to um, the ascension of Jesus. And they're, they're in 25 different stories. Have a look at them. Again, they have English language materials with them. There's a video that you can watch to see how to use them, um, and they may be helpful. So feel free just to flick through them and have a look as well. Thanks. Great. Well, hello again. Um, we're going to turn in our Bibles in a moment to a very easy passage to find, Genesis 1 to 3. Uh, after a few words of introduction. And uh, Monday we were thinking about God's faithfulness to the nations, how he had a plan not just for individuals to be saved, but for nations. And uh, we thought about their movement and migration. On Tuesday, we looked at God's mystery faithfully revealed that it's in his church where he chooses to display his multicolored manifold wisdom. Uh, especially through the inclusion of the Gentiles, the ethne, the ethnic other, along with the Jews. Tomorrow we're going to be thinking about hospitality. Today we're thinking about spaces and places, God's faithfulness in spaces and places. After a short talk, we're going to have uh, a video interview. We're going to do some sampling of some surveys. And this time we're going to try to get to question and answer before we conclude with a response time and a prayer. You've all heard of salvation history, probably. But what about salvation geography? So says one of my colleagues at Oak Hill College, Matthew Sleeman. Now, Matthew is fascinated by spaces and places. And he rejoices that in the academic world, at least, 
there's a renewed interest in the science of place. Matthew's hoping that this renewed interest will be matched with a paralleled new interest, or perhaps renewed interest, in the theology of place. Appreciating salvation history, yes, of course, but alongside and enriched by salvation geography. To use his own words, when we're considering that biblical drama of creation, fall, redemption, consummation, Matthew says, salvation geography is an invitation to spatialize this narrative, to see it as playing out across space as well as through time. And he believes that this will give us a richer picture of what God has done. It will bring greater glory to God and it will more firmly locate us where God has put us to live God-glorifying lives in the here and now. Now, Matthew's got a great hero. His name is uh, Edward Soja, not a Christian writer. He's written a book called Third Space. And Soja complains that Western thought generally has prioritized history and time over space and place. Time and history have been seen as active and dynamic, whereas spaces and places have just been reduced to the insignificant containers, the background scenery of no importance, the, the passive, the static locations in which the real action has played out. And I think Soja is onto something. Many of us Christians were happy to ponder timings and timelines, but we're always slightly suspicious about material places and material things. There's something in the back of our minds, isn't there, that tells us that material things are unspiritual, that they will one day pass away completely, it seems to be in our minds. And I think that's a bias in our spirituality that has less to do with the scriptures and perhaps more to do with ancient Greek philosophy, which permeates Western culture. But you can argue the point with me later, but you'll agree with me on this. Christians are not disembodied spirits. We're not saved and gathered together into kind of spirit clouds floating in the sky. And if you look at salvation history, it's worked out in specific important places. Redemption history happened in named places with real significance. Where did the church start? Jerusalem. How did it spread? Through mappable locations, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Ephesus was a place before Ephesians was an epistle. Now, at this point, you may be thinking, this sounds like he's going to go a bit weird, or, or you might be thinking, well, this might be helpful. Hopefully you're thinking the latter, just to stay with the word weird for a while. Uh, Matthew, my colleague, he likes to take new Oak Hill students out into the local community in Southgate, North London, to walk around, watch, stand still, feel, witness people and their stories occupying the space. And one time, the first years, they came back a little bit confused and a bit bemused looking. It wasn't what they were expecting at all from week one orientation. Matthew had had them stand right in the middle of Cat Hill Roundabout, a very busy roundabout with all the traffic whizzing by, just trying to absorb the space and the place. Matthew didn't want them to forget where they were when they were studying their theology. Well, I'm gonna to promise today not to take you out to the A66 and make you stand in the middle of the Crothwaite roundabout. If you promise to look out for any books by Matthew, he's got one coming out soon. He's got one already out. I'll put it there, you can have a look at. Slightly technical, but he also recommends this, much more accessible. Craig Bartholomew, Where Mortals Dwell, and it's on the resource list. Now, Bartholomew, he thinks that these days we're all suffering from something called placelessness. That's to say that in these postmodern times, we're, we're losing our sense of space and place. We're losing our connection to location. Take the rise of the internet, for example, which contributes to this malaise. He cites David Lyon, another writer, on cyberspace. There is no place to this space. When you enter cyberspace, your actual location fades from view, doesn't it? And because you can access virtual reality from any place, 
the particular place matters less and less. And it's because of this virtual reality and placenessness that we're beginning to suffer, Bartholomew thinks. I've got a question for you. What do you think is the difference between space and, it's a rhetorical question, space and place? I'll give you my own, my own answer by reading some coordinates for you. Latitude, 32 degrees, 43 minutes, 59.99 seconds north. Longitude, 35 degrees, 2 minutes, 60 seconds east. I was going to say, does that have any meaning for you? But I'm a bit nervous that somebody is a geography geek and will probably tell me exactly where it is. But let me, this, let me just put it this way. Hopefully, that doesn't have too much meaning for most of you. That's just a way to locate a space. It doesn't tell you anything about the place. If I told you that that place was a mountain, then you'd start to get more of a connection. We're surrounded by mountains here, and we appreciate them. If I told you it was a mountain in the Old Testament, you'd probably start thinking about some of the famous mountains in the Old Testament and what they meant. If I told you that that space was the ultimate place for the prophet of Yahweh to confront the prophets of Baal, between Elijah's Israel to the south and Jezebel's Tyre and Sidon to the north, with the sea to the west, where Elijah later saw that little cloud, now the space is starting to become a place in your minds, rich with meaning. Where is that space? What's the name of the place? Mount Carmel. A little bit of geography goes a long way because places matter. Place is a very human concept. It's a rich concept. It relates to memories and history and associations. Place is storied. Place is dynamic. It's contested. It's made and destroyed. It's layered. Here's another rhetorical question for you. Was Eden a real place? Now, I'm sorry I can't give you the geographical coordinates today, but I can give you the place in the Bible, at least, where you can find it. And the creation story is, is redolent with spaces and places. Think about it. What does God create? The heavens and the earth. What happens there? Places are differentiated from each other. There's the heavens from the earth. There's the land from the sea. Different things are created to occupy different spaces. Celestial lights are placed in the heavens. Birds are placed in the air. Mammals for the land and fish for the waters. And finally, humans are created and blessed with the divine image, the Imago Dei. But although they enjoy the divine image, they aren't like God in every way. They aren't omnipresent. Mankind was specifically put in particular places. The writer stresses it. Genesis 2, verse 8. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. It's important. He repeats it in verse 15. The Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Where was Adam and Eve's place? Eden. That's where they lived. That's where they moved. That's where they had their being. They knew it like the backs of their hand. They looked after it. It looked after them. Chapter 2, verse 8 to 14 reads a little bit like a state agent blurb. Adam and Eve's new place. Eden, beautiful garden. Well, I don't know why I'm doing an Essex accent, but I'll persevere. Well watered, access to four rivers, very fertile, lots of trees, well situated. It's in the east really good for organic, locally sourced food. Does that sound anything like your place, I wonder? You should see my place. My place. Evocative phrase, isn't it? I'm really at home in my place. Eden was Adam and Eve's place. They were created to be in-placed creatures. 
In fact, that's one of the key things that distinguishes them in the creator-creature distinction and distinguishes us. It's that being in place. But if in Genesis 2, humans are happily placed, in Genesis 3, things go badly wrong. After eating the fruit, the first thing we see is that Adam and Eve are scurrying around looking for hiding places among the trees. And a significant part of the Lord's judgment on them involved place. Driven from Eden, they became, became displaced. They were in place, now they're displaced. Chapter 3, verse 23. So the Lord banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. Now their experience of place was to be transformed. Banished from Eden, they would eat by the sweat of their brows amid thickets of thorns and thistles. Reading the creation narratives through the prism of place, Bartholomew argues, and I agree, is enriching, but why stop there? Think about all the other places named in the scriptures. I don't think we've got time to name them all today, but think of Ur, where Adam left. Think of Canaan, where the patriarchs wandered in anticipation. Think about Egypt, evocative of slavery and bondage, but actually also the womb in which God's people grew to full term. Consider the wilderness, a place of testing and complaining. Sinai, a place where Israel was constituted spiritually. What about Ebenezer, that monumental place of reminder? Think of Jerusalem and the temple, the place where God put his name. And I know the name Golgotha means so much to all of us, the place of the skull, where your savior and mine bled and died to make us right with God. Places matter. Now, without wanting to descend into place idolatry or uh, territorialism or nationalism or location superstition, all of which are possible, I'm simply wanting to encourage us today to enjoy a richer theology of place. To understand that our places are more important than perhaps we think. Heaven's a real place, isn't it? Do you intend to go there as a spiritual vapor or as an embodied person? Hasn't Jesus gone ahead of us in a body to prepare for us what? John 14, verse 1 to 4, to prepare a place. And your place here on earth, too, is important. It's important because God has created it. And it's important because divine image bearers have lived in it, still live in it. It has living texture. It has people with stories and histories. It has layers of time. It is rich and redolent with memories. Even if perhaps sometimes you think your local patch is a bit of a dump, it is a significant place because what God has dignified it with. It's a place for God's kingdom to be extended. It's a place for spiritual work to be done. If on Tuesday we emphasized the importance of the local church, our emphasis today is very firmly on the word local. Where is your local church? What's the area like? Who lives there? Who comes and goes? What are the local stories? What are the felt needs? Who are the providers, the service providers in the area? How can you get to know your local patch better, more deeply, so that you can minister the gospel there more effectively? Before we briefly consider a case study from an urban church in Reading, uh, we're going to address some of these questions by thinking about local community surveying with Maura. Okay, um, in just a minute, we're going to watch a Zoom interview together. And I'm sorry the quality isn't very good, but hopefully we can listen to the content and make something from that. But the interview is with um, a gentleman called Nilash Sharma. 
He comes from Smedic in the West Midlands, and he just shares some of his experience of being out and about in the community around his church. Um, now, one of the ways of getting to know the community around us is to use questionnaires, but it, it's not the only way. Um, but questionnaires are really useful because they help us to gather information that we can use later. Um, they're also helpful because we can adapt them and use them in different ways as, our, as we begin to get um, a feeling for the community around us and as our presence is known within the community around us. So hopefully when you came in, you were given um, a set of papers that look a little bit like this. It has our street on the front. Um, don't worry about those for the moment, but on the back there is a grid like this. And it's just put there to help um, you while you're listening. Maybe there's some things that Nilash says that are helpful and you can just jot them down and we'll have a chat about those afterwards. But there's three areas that are worth thinking about. Um, the first one is useful things to do and think about when we're going out into the communities around our churches. Uh, number two is things we can avoid. Number three, the benefits of working with other people. And number four, the place of prayer. So maybe there's a few things that Nilesh says that are helpful and you can put those in there and we can talk about them later. Does anybody need one of these or has everybody got one? Would you like one? There's a few people I think that perhaps, um, thank you. Great. There's no sound. I just have a few questions I'd love to ask you about how you go out into the community around your church in Smethwick um, and how you might use questionnaires that you've seen um, to engage with the community around you. So I was just wondering, um, when you go out onto the streets in Smethwick, um, how do you decide who you're going to talk to? Um, it's the high more, yeah. It's very. Um... I think you develop a sense. Uh, I normally, when we look at the, when we go out, I normally look at the face of the people coming and sometimes you can tell if they're in a hurry, if they're not in a hurry. So you have to sort of just be a little bit practical first. Normally people I think who are not in a hurry and I think will be able to talk, I approach them. Um, and particularly if we're in the middle of a shopping uh, complex where there's lots of shops, people tend to be very busy. So I tend to be a bit behind. I tend to go a little bit further away, either when they're leaving the complex or entering, when I know they've got a bit more time. Mm. Uh, but ultimately, you, I just pray in my heart and ask the Lord to help me. And don't be afraid of a rejection. If somebody says, no, I haven't got time, I just smile, say thank you very much, and then move on. Mm. I think that's really important, isn't it? It's, um, it's, it we sometimes make things so personal, but it's, it's not that at all, and, it, and that's great. Um, and when you have found somebody that you feel you can engage with, how would you go about introducing yourself? I think I've tried to be as non-threatening as possible, so I reassure them who I am. I give my name and I say I'm from a local church and I'm just interested in asking them if it's a questionnaire about their opinion about things that are happening around them in the community. And I sort of then stop and and I sort of make it a point, it's, you have to be sensitive to the person you're talking to, that I'm not after anything, I don't want any money from them, I don't want to, you know, because so many times people are stopped in the street for people trying to sign them up to something, and, you know, and if you, particularly if you've got a, pap, if you've got a uh, you know, if you've got the, uh, the questionnaire in your hand and stuff like that, so, and sometimes I'll even point to the question, I'll say, look, I just want to find out, because we're interested in the community and we want to find ways we can serve. We and I try to just mention gently that Christians, we believe it's important to love our neighbours and to sort of help people. So it would be lovely to hear what their perspectives are. Mm, that's great. And um, if you sense that somebody's sort of open to a little bit more conversation, what kind of things would you say to, to get that conversation to go a little bit further? Um, I think... Um, you know, I point out to them, because one of the questions I think is, do you go, have you ever been to a church? And sometimes that, that really opens up the door because some have some, often you'll get the response, I used to go or I've never been or I don't even know what a church is, depends on their background. 
Um, and then I have the opportunity to share a little bit about the Lord Jesus. So I always take, um, have some tracts with me, a little, we're just pointing people to the Lord. Um, so I, and then I just take the opportunity to share a little bit more with them. Um, but again, you have to be sensitive. And I think for that, you really have to pray and ask the Lord to open up the hearts. I mean, one or two people I spoke to, um, I remember one man, I said, what concerns you? And he said, my family. So then, I, then what I did was I said, well, just tell me about your family. What is it that you're concerned about? So he told me about his children and stuff like that. So then I just said, okay, would you just mind if I wrote down their ages? I didn't ask for their names. I thought I didn't want to be too intrusive here. And then I said, can I pray for them right now? Can I just pray? He said, what a lovely concern you have for your family. Not many people would have said that. Um, you know, they can really concern for the, they're growing up. So then I was able to pray. And he was really touched by that. And then I shared a little bit of, of, of a gospel with him as well. So I think it's about being sensitive to the need of the people as they respond. And it's not a tick box exercise. And I think God does soften people's hearts. As, and I think that's the big thing. Yeah, I think that's very true. Um, now, Smedic is in the middle of quite a, a multicultural community, um, mainly Punjabi speakers, um, lots of Hindus um, and Sikhs in the area. Um, how useful do you think it is to have speakers of other languages on a team going out to do questionnaires in an environment like that? Very useful, if possible. Um, I, fortunately, I, I'm able to converse in one of the languages. So often I'll get puzzled looks from um, quite a few people I stopped, didn't understand the English. So I straight away switched to an Asian language, Punjabi. And uh, they sort of got, yeah, they understood then. But uh, I think if you don't have, if you're not able to speak in one of the languages, then it's really important to find someone who can, who can help you with that. Because it just opens a door of communication that you would lack. Um, broken English or simplified English can also help. And particularly if you're talking to a group, sometimes one person in the group can translate or explain for the others. And if you have no one, you just do the best you can. And then I always have some literature or something where I can point them to and say, well, this is the church. And if I have something in their language, that might help. Mm -hmm. But um, I think it's, if you can, I think it's really important to pray that God can provide or you can get in touch with someone who can speak in one of the, the languages of the community around you. That would really be a very powerful way to communicate. <clears throat> Yeah, that's really helpful. And I think that helps us as well as, as communities of believers to help each other out wherever we might be. Um, we can help each other out with these kind of things and, and we don't have to be alone. And I think it's important to remember that. Um, now, just recently, we were out in the streets in, in uh, Medic and we had an OM team of young people that joined us. Um, how, how helpful was that to have a young group of, of teenagers with us very good. Um, it's just nice to have uh, people who are keen for the Lord and, and want to help. And even if they don't, um, some were you know, slightly more experienced than others, but it was for them a learning curve as well as for us. Um, and I felt their presence was very good. They were able to contribute. Uh, it was interesting, one of them came with me and was quite quiet initially, but was then as we met people and started speaking, he came out of himself and started really sharing. And we was able to pray for another one of the people we met. And, and another one of the, the girls who, who was with us, um, she was able to relate. It's amazing how God brings people who, you know, the talents that, or the experiences in life that you've had, that they're relevant. To, we met a homeless man and uh, she had some training in, in sort of working with adults with special needs and things like that. And she was able to minister to him as well. So it was just wonderful when you just trust God and just go in faith. And there was one other boy as well. Uh, he was from, in, um, he had it from an Asian background. And one of the boys we met, we were on the way back, we met a group of three boys and we were talking to them. And, and because he had his name badge on, the, one of the boys we were talking to said, I, that name, are you from this part of India? And he said, yeah, he said, I, I'm also from that part. You know, my, my mother's from that part. So straight away, there was a connection. And you know, I would have thought, and even though that community isn't in this part of the of the Midlands, uh, it's, it's in London. Uh, and I thought to myself, well, that's how can God? It's, it's God's in this in some way, mm. uh, and bringing people and you know situations like that. Mm. So definitely, it's, um, and I think it's important. 
to encourage young people, and particularly from OM and any other uh, uh, organization like that, that because uh, it's also good for them to learn as well as there is support to the local people who are doing the, the, the work. Mm. That's wonderful. Um, Nilesh, just in closing, um, now you were from a Hindu background and um, can you just share with us, obviously when we go out into the community, we're hoping that people will come in um, to, to the church community. Um, and can you just share how you ended up in a church building um, from your Hindu background, just briefly? Yeah, I, I think the first was there was an invite for an event that was happening and I was, I was just a loose end and I was 16. So I just thought, oh, I'll come along and see what's going on. But the moment I went inside and met, uh, it was an OM team actually there and the Christians there, what, what touched me was the what I saw in their friendship with each other and the way they shared. I, even though I didn't understand much, they were very welcoming. I think the one thing I would say, they were very loving and very welcoming. And in fact, I used to go back every day. I, I didn't believe the first time I came in, even though I heard the gospel, they preached the gospel, they did everything, I didn't make much sense to me. Uh, but when I went back over the days, um, I used to go back every day and join them in their meal times and just get to know them as people. I could genuinely see something of Christ in them, even though I didn't know what I was seeing. And um, I joined them as they read the Bible and God began to use all of that to stir a desire for him in my life. And uh, one of them asked me if I'd like to give my life to the Lord. And uh, I said, yeah, I definitely want to follow this Lord. What I'm seeing in front of me, this love and peace that you have and what you're telling me about Jesus, I really want to commit my life to him. So I felt that was, you know, the, the way they honored the word, they honored, they, they showed the love of Christ and the community of believers, that really touched me. And the, then the Lord Jesus was able to save me from all my background um, and everything. And, you know, he's been doing it since. But as I said, it's, it's that um, just allowing God, God's spirit to move in their lives and honoring him. I think that was the, the biggest thing that touched me. Nilash, thank you so much. We really appreciate um, the conversation. That was, it's wonderful. Thank you. Thank, no, thank you as well. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Um, Tim, are we able to use a roving mic? That would be great. So I just wondered if there were any, any comments from you in terms of perhaps something new that struck you or something you'd like to share. We've got a roving mic and we'll just hand it round. Anybody? I was just struck by how um, when other people came out with him, even if they didn't have all of the skills or abilities, that actually it was a real journey for them. Yeah. And they, they learned more about um, doing the ministry. They learned more about their own character. God grew them in courage. It just was really special to see that, how God used uh, people who didn't necessarily have all the skills but grew them in their faith and in their ability to do it. I was touched by that. Thanks so much, Jason. Yeah, I think that's really important. And Nilash alluded to the whole area of um, rejection and to handle rejection lightly. And the fact that it's a learning curve for all of us. We go out there, some days we, we experience real rejection, lots of no's, um, and that kind of sets us back a bit. But that, that thing of going back and learning and progressing um, is really important. Thank you, Jason. Um, yes. I, one of the things that I picked up is um, asking somebody if they want prayer, but not asking for the family names, but their ages. And that's something that's really impacted me. At the, yeah. yeah. I think that's very important, isn't it? That we don't ask inappropriate information from people, um, that, that we allow them to give what they want to give and, and not ask for things that are inappropriate. I think that's right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think the other thing I found in, helpful there was the encounter that they had with that uh, particular man who had come from a similar part of India and wasn't meant to be in, in Smevek. Mm. Uh, I'm part of the Gideons, so when I go out and hand out Bibles, I am terrified. I think it's remembering, isn't it, as you no, no, said there, that you're not doing it in your own strength, are you? Mm. Thankfully. Yeah. That's, that's really encouraging, isn't it? That um, we know that 
God places people in the right places um, for the right things. I thought it was really interesting that he talked about using sort of practical things like name badges, which immediately give a connection and um, show our authenticity as well. Um, but yes, I think that whole thing of praying that God will put the right people in the right places at the right times for those, um, those conversations and also just softening people's hearts so they're ready to receive. I think there was one more person over here, Bill, um, if that's okay. I was just to um, share an experience. Uh, I did a similar question out of this. Um, well, we did door to door um, in, a, in a street near us and uh, we found that um, we knew there were a lot of internationals in the area because it's near a university. And uh, the internationals were the most engaged <laughs> with the question and, and seemed almost appreciative that we'd almost like, oh, thank you for showing an interest in me because they seemed to feel quite isolated in the community. Um, there were also some um, British women who were talkative, um, not as much as the internationals, um, but the least talkative were British men who <laughs> seemed to want to get back to watching the TV or, you know, <laughs> didn't, seem, didn't seem very thankful that you'd called, you know. But. Thank you, that's really helpful. I think, oh, last one, just over here. Um, it, that's, that's just um, made me think a little bit about, Nilash talked about the fact that he often took tracks out with him. And some of you will be aware of life words. D does anybody know life words? They came out of SGM. They do some really great materials. So this one here is about the prodigal son, but they do them in several languages so that you can, just if you know a bit about your area and make sure you've got materials in the languages that you might encounter, it's really helpful. So that's a really good one. Matthias Press also do um, an assortment of things. This is Two Ways to Live, and they do this in lots of different languages. And it's, it's a really nice one as well because it's quite picture. It's got a lot of sort of symbolism and pictures in it. It's really good. So that's a good one. LifeWords, again, do lots of things at Christmas and Easter time. They're attractive. They're really nice. They do great stuff. Do go and look at their website. And since we've got a Gideon man here, I love the Gideons because they've sourced so many New Testaments for me in different languages. They can get just about everything. They once um, came to one of our English classes and I think they sourced 24 different languages for us on one evening. So that was fantastic. Yeah, last question. Um, you mentioned, you referred to the fact that somebody was from India, they were speaking another language. Uh, what I have found I mean, I, I've worked in Latin America, and if I hear anybody speaking Spanish, um, that's, that's the sort of key for me to go off and speak to them in Spanish and, yeah. and make the contact that way. And it strikes me that the same would be true if you were hearing Punjabi or something like that. that yeah. Yes, that's, that's, that's the reason to go up and speak to them in Punjabi and see if you can make a contact that way. Yeah. There's something so wonderful about mother tongue the minute you hear it or a place that you've worked, it strikes something very deep within you, doesn't it? Um, so that's right. Thank you. That's really helpful. We're just going to take a few minutes to look at these sample questionnaires that you've got. Um, so there are three different questionnaires here. The first one was the one that actually Nilash was talking about that they used in West Medic. It's one that was drawn from the survey that they use at Oak Hill College. Um, the second one is a questionnaire that it's not really been completed, but it's been used by a guy called Mark Vernon, who works with Friends International and various other groups. Um, and he's given us permission to look at this. Please don't take this away and print it because it's not um, available for printing. It's his ideas. So it's just to stimulate some conversation. And when we look at this, just look at questions one to eight. Don't go down to nine to 12 because that's more about church. Um, and then the last one here is the Community Questionnaire for International Residents. This is taken from this book, So to Reap. So to Reap was written by the charity that Dave and I are involved with. Um, and it's just, it, it talks about ways of setting up English for outreach. So that's there. So the idea of this is just to talk with somebody near you um, about, look at the questionnaires and try and identify questions that you think are useful but useful for you in your situation. So wherever you are, where your church is placed, are there any questions there that you look at and you think that would be a really good question to, to use? And then think about why you might use that question. Um, when, we, when we started looking at using questionnaires, it's really important to think about the purpose of the questionnaire. So are you just trying to get to know your community for the first time? 
or are you going back for a second time and you want to to sort of have those deeper questions um, that will lead to deeper conversations and be a little bit more searching? Or is it just to, to get some facts and figures about the area? What's the purpose of your questionnaire? So if you can make this as personal to you as possible, that would be really helpful. We'll give you a few minutes. If you're on your own, um, feel free to work with somebody else. I know you're probably from different areas, but you might be able to spark some information off between each other. So we'll just take five minutes to have a look at that. Okay, sorry to call you back. I know it's... If we had more time, I think we could have some really great conversations about these questions, and I'm sorry we don't have time for that this morning, but do take it away. Do, do talk about it more with each other and with your church fellowship. Thank you, Maura. Um, I've mentioned Reading. I know Graham's also from Reading. Anybody else lived in Reading? <laughs> so Graham's from his churches in the east side of Reading. I'm going to just um, ask us to consider some distilled or boiled down results, if you like, from questionnaires in about the year 2008 in West Reading in the community around um, Cary Baptist Church. Now, they do a census here every 10 years. So I don't think this should be written in stone for more than 10 years either. Uh, established churches might like to think of regularly, every 10 years, re-evaluating their community because of all the transition, relearning, uh, reconnecting with their community. So just to say, when people expressed felt needs at one point in the questionnaire, uh, what were the felt needs, the top five things that came out. And you won't be surprised by these things, especially insofar as new people had come from the nations newly into the community. What were they looking for? Um, they wanted help with jobs. They wanted help of a practical nature, a whole variety. They wanted help with the English language. They wanted help with accommodation, finding it. And they wanted help with a sense of community. Most of those are quite predictable. Which one were we most surprised by? The last one, actually, that people would articulate that. Which ones should the church think about trying to provide the answers for or some provision for? All of them? No. I don't think as churches we should try to provide of all, all the provision in the local community. It wouldn't be right. It would be, it'd be impossible. It would be proud. There are loads of other governments and other agencies that provide services. We should know about them and point people to them, but there may be some that we can actually do ourselves, get involved with ourselves. So Cary Baptist Church decided to go for the last one and the third one, especially. Now, of course, people are people, life is messy. You sometimes get involved with some of the other things on a one-to-one -one basis. But organizationally, we knew that we could, with the buildings we had, with the English speakers we had, with the coffee and tea facilities we had, with the whiteboards on the rooms, chairs and tables, we knew that we had everything to run English classes just like that once we were organized. Uh, and some of the resources will tell you how you can get started or improve your English language provision. It's a very obvious way to help the nations in our local community. Uh, if your church is small, you could maybe gather together with other churches, coordinate with other churches across your town and city, so that you can say, oh, we don't have anything on a Monday night, but there's a church on the other side of Reading that, that does. Uh, and then sense of community. Uh, people love, people from the nations, especially newly arrived, love to come into church. Uh, you can do that obviously on a Sunday, uh, church lunches, but you can create other. Be creative. Um, international food nights, for example, and you can share life uh, together. But we're getting on to food and that's tomorrow's topic. Um, I'll shut up now and I'll bring the mic around for any uh, Q&A. Now, on Tuesday we didn't have a chance, so your questions and comments may be from Tuesdays or from today's. Let's spend five minutes just uh, responding to questions and comments from the floor. Maureen, do you want to come up?
Um, just a practical thing on um, a s survey. Do you, do you wear anything particular? Do you wear high-vis jackets? Do you carry a clipboard or, or anything like that? Or do you wear shirts with the church's name on it? Is there anything like that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so when we've done it, we've taken out surveys that are obvious and, and clipboards and worn um, badges when we've done it just so that we are really clear and transparent about who we are, where we're coming from. And I think often, I mean, you know, how many times do you get stopped in the street by people with um, clipboards and, and avoid people with clipboards? So sometimes it does cause people to avoid you. But often, if you've got something there and you just say, hey, we'd love to know a little bit about what you think and this is what we're looking at and show them it, they're much more willing to respond to that. And, and like Nilash said, to make clear that you're not there for money or anything else. That's really helpful. That's the way we've done it. People do lots of different things. I'm sure in this room, you've got some other ways of doing it that work really well, but that's, that's how we found it works. Thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna ask Graham to bring his question from Tuesday or his comment. David, at my age, how do you expect me to remember what I said on Tuesday? <laughs> I, I can help you with that. All right. It, it was actually about um, when you're reaching out to a community, um, how much ethnic, ethnic specific should it be? You know, is it good to say we're going to reach the people from Pakistan or from Nepal or from Africa or from China? You know, and how do we just manage that whole thing? Thank you, great question. And uh, our communities are full of people from all different nationalities and we need to know roughly, you know, what percentage of people, that's where Data Shine and Nomis Web, some of the websites can help us to find out who's living in our community. Um, I've always thought that uh, as a returned missionary from Ethiopia, it would have been so easy to, for me to think, oh, I'm just going to look for Ethiopians. I don't think that's helpful. Although I, when I meet an Ethiopian, like our friend from Latin America, I'm going to use Amharic and I've got a special connection there. But the gospel is always for all nations, isn't it? And I think our church outreach should focus on the all nations aspect of that. And in our local communities, there probably will be all nations. Now, obviously, there may be ethnicities and religious backgrounds that dominate. And of course, we should cater for that, have it in mind. I don't think we should ever let them dominate our outreach. So if there's an English class and it's all full of one demographic, that can be quite unhelpful in a variety of ways. In terms of the English, it's better for people to hear other people's English from other parts of the world rather than have a mother tongue interference reinforced and just hearing, let's say they're all Bangladeshi women. Uh, if they're just hearing each other speak English, that's not nearly as good. And in terms of worldview, as if they're hearing a Colombian speak English. And uh, there's something about the worldview that's challenging and challenged too about having ethnicities uh, together. A very good question. Um, I think we've got time for one more or a comment. Uh, our church is uh, in a mainly African um, uh, area, but, but it just struck me then, what do you do, how do you target it? I mean, what about white British people? Do, do you not stop them? Do you, do you ignore them? Do you, do you just aim at, you know, darker skinned people? Or what? How does that work? Good question. <laughs> That's a good question. It's going to make me answer it. Um, yeah, I think when you're getting to know your community, you get to know the whole community. And that's good. If you're out on the roads, you talk to whoever comes your way. I think that's really important. Um, but often, I think it is the way that um, in multicultural areas, like our brother already shared, often it will be the people from other parts of the world that will really stop and chat with you. And that's just been our experience. But yeah, I think you're there for everyone. So. And sometimes if you emphasize a mission to the nations in our local communities. Sometimes people can feel that, oh, the white people are getting forgotten. And of course, we never want to forget anybody. And we keep reaching out to everybody, to all who will hear. And often, it, Moore and I have been heavily engaged in um, cross-cultural ministry in the UK. But there have always been white Brits that somehow find their way into things and into our lives that we continue to minister to. And it's important not to forget anybody. Last one. Okay, great. Think, um, just 
Can I make one more comment? I think that also refers back to Nilash when he said it's useful to have speakers of other languages on your team. Um, often, if you have a multicultural, multi-ethnic team going out on the streets, they will naturally attract different people as well. So that's helpful. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So um, it's been good just to chat a little bit about um, about outreach in your community and getting to know your community better. Um, but I think we'd all probably say it's it's really hard work. We have days when we go out in the community and it's exciting and it's fun and then we have days that are really difficult. And just recently I was listening to a Bible study by um, Beth Moore. She was talking, she was using the analogy from um, James 5 of the, the farmer going out and the verse that she read was, consider the farmers who wait patiently for the rains in the fall and in the spring. They eagerly look for the valuable harvest to ripen you too must be patient. Uh, and I started to think about sort of cross-cultural outreach and that whole area. And um, there are times when we go out in the community that are very rich and everybody seems to want to talk and everybody seems interested. And then there are periods of time when we try to engage with our community and it's dry and it's hard work and people don't seem to want to engage and they're not interested. Um, but James says, wait for the rain. So I, I want to encourage you this morning, if you're in that period of time in your community where you're seeing lots going on and it's really exciting, thank God he's faithful. That's wonderful, isn't it? But if you're in that period of time where it's very dry and everything seems very hard work, don't be discouraged, just keep going. The rains will come. Um, be encouraged and um, as all of you in ministry will know, Things take time, we need to wait patiently, and sometimes the contacts that we make will take 10 or 15 years to come to fruition. So let's encourage each other to keep waiting. So um, from today, maybe there's a few things that you can be personally thinking about to take away, or maybe things that you've been stimulated to think about to share with your church members. And let me just um, put some things out there for you, you might consider. You could spend some time just sitting on a wall or a bench to watch how your community operates and what people do. That's a really interesting thing to do. We're all about doing being British, aren't we? But sometimes just being is really important. And especially in cross-cultural communities, if you sit somewhere, you will, you'll learn so much. Um, so that's one thing. Perhaps you could put together a simple questionnaire to spend some time um, out on the streets or maybe door to door. I don't know what you do in your church fellowship, but if you haven't done a questionnaire, don't be frightened of doing it now. There's time to do it. Um, start now and, and start looking at your community in a different way. Maybe you can adapt an old questionnaire to incorporate some of those more searching questions and move a bit forward to talk specifically about Jesus with those questionnaires. Um, and maybe you could take some more time just to pray specifically for your local community or arrange a prayer walk. I know a lot of churches do that now. So just thinking of those things, maybe those are some useful ideas to take forward. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have appointed our times in history and that you've laid the boundaries in which we live. This gives us such great confidence when we're interacting with the communities around our churches that their presence and ours are not accidental, but are all part of your wider plan for us and for them. Father, encourage those here this morning who feel weary and discouraged in cross-cultural work. Refresh them and fill them with a renewed joy in getting to know those people you have placed nearby who've come from other parts of the world and may speak other languages. Father, we pray for those who are experiencing good times. We, we really thank you for those spring rains and we pray that you would encourage them further, Lord, to make strong friendships and invest in discipling those you have brought into their churches. And for those who are just beginning to think about how they might engage with their communities around them, Father, we pray that you would enable them to make those first steps to get going. Thank you, Father, for each other. Thank you for the encouragement we can be to each other and help us to reflect your glory in all that we do and in the way that we act. For your name's sake, amen.